Thank you guys for coming. Um, welcome to the second annual Student Research Day at York. I am, yes. Um, my name is Professor Kelly Josephs. I will be the master of ceremonies apparently today. Um, can you hear me? I know that I speak. You can? Okay, good, thank you. Um, as I said, welcome to the second annual Research Day at York College. Um, this program is organized primarily by the Office of Undergraduate Research, and it seeks to not only encourage our students' research and creative activities, but also to celebrate those activities. Um, many of you may have already gone to uh, panel one, and we have several other panels later today, as well as an exhibition in the atrium. Um, today, we are feting our students. Um, and their mentors, of course, faculty here at York, as they showcase ongoing projects on subjects ranging from pesticides and neurotoxins to the real violence of history and simulated violence of video games. Um, though this is probably the most visible of its activities, um, of the activities of the Office of Undergraduate Research, um, they have lots going on throughout the year, and we welcome you to um, join them. There's a page in the program that lists some of them. It also lists their mission, um, which and they aim to enable students to um, research and produce projects across disciplines, provide our students with opportunities for presenting and publishing their work, and enhancing their postgraduate competitiveness um, and encourage faculty members to mentor them. Um, so I will now turn it over to Rishi. Dr. Rishi Nam is professor in, math, in the math department and the director of undergraduate research, and he'll tell you a little bit more about today's mission and its history. Thank you, thank, thank you, sorry, thanks. Uh, Dr. Joseph so much. Um, when I'm, I'm Rishi Nath, <coughs> Director of the Office of Undergraduate Research and Assistant Professor in the Math Department. When, when Provost Griffith asked me um, a year and a half ago to be a part of the new initiative, um, which he aptly titled the uh, Office of Undergraduate Research and the Student Research Inis Initiative, uh, I had to do some research and I had to really come to grips and understand what research is. Certainly encompasses um, scientific, creative inquiry uh, done on your own or with your mentor. Certainly encompasses creative works and performances. There are so many ways in which one can delve into research. The theme of this year's conference, which is our second, is the future is now. And when we came up with this theme, there were several ways in which we understood this could be interpreted, and I'd just like to touch on them. So one is clearly that for the students involved in research, their future is now. Uh, the things that they are investigating and developing and considering, um, if it's in their area of, of their chosen subject field, or even if it's not will have an effect on their uh, future choices, will have an effect on their um, graduate school choices if they choose to go into the um, world and, and, and uh, compete in, in an arena which doesn't involve graduate school. Whatever inquiry they're doing now will, will aid that. But in another sense, the future is now means and can be interpreted as the fact that as you look around, whether it be locally in New York City, 
the U.S. or internationally, uh, there are so many pressing issues, environmental, governmental, um, you know, military uh, conflicts, as well as uh, struggles um, just to uh, maintain a certain level of economic health and well-being, psychological health and well-being. And to research is to really address that question, the future is now, um, because the future is upon us. And so not only do we try to determine what are the answers to the questions that we uh, investigate, but we also hope to take some part of that and apply it to the question, what is our role? What is our place in these, um, in, in this, in this, in these conflicts? So with that in mind, it, it was really a treat and, and uh, very generous of um, our keynote speaker today, Stacey Ann Chin, who will be introduced a little later, um, to agree to join us on very short notice. Um, certainly her work um, in many ways grapples with the question and we've asked her to speak a little bit on that question of, of what is the, the role of, a, of an artist and a thinker in, in difficult times. Um, before I introduce um, Provost Griffith, I'd like to say that uh, there are a number of people and institutions who have made this day possible. Certainly the outpouring, if you have been to the poster arrangements outside, you can see that, I mean, last year it was tremendous. And this year uh, I had um, members of the Undergraduate Research Advisory Council, who I'd like to thank, uh, coming to me and saying, what are we doing? Were we prepared for this? Where can we put these people? And I said, it's a problem, but it's a good problem. Um, because what it shows is that as I've believed for a long time, York students are talented. If you tell them what to do, you know, many people will find it surprising, but often you just need to get out of their way and they'll actually find a solution. And I think if you go to the, if you go to the, if you go to the poster session, you'll see sort of what I mean. Uh, it's, it's, it's really impressive. And there are a number of, of panels which also are very exciting we have uh, um, topics as diverse as the economic crisis in Greece. We have students delivering original fiction. Um, and there's a, a special 10 minute um, uh, theatrical presentation which members of the theater soci society are doing in conjunction with the aviation um, major. So that's all I have to say. At this time I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Provost Griffith, who is the person responsible for our initiative today. Give him another round of applause, Rishi Nan. I don't know how many of you know Professor Nath well but I always look forward to an opportunity to see him just in his GQ outfit. Uh, Rishi is known to be casual, but he's appropriately dressed. And I gotta figure out how much are we paying this guy that he's able to Not buy enough. these? <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> Not enough. Right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Wanna start by doing a check to see who is in the house. Do we have any chemistry students in the house? Yeah. Kind of a weak chemistry. Do we have any chemistry students in the house? Larry Johnson, what are you feeding these chemistry students? They're not energized enough. Let's try biology. Any biology students in the house? Now, do we have any art, performing arts, music students in the house? You should have been playing something, blowing a vuvuzela or something, you know, to let us get away. What about students from history? There you go. What about students from English? Do we have any students from social sciences? Do we have any students from OT? All right, let me hear. Every other student who is in the house, give yourselves a round of applause.
Thank you for coming to our second annual undergraduate research day. I want to pick up on one of the things that Professor Naff said in his remarks. And it connects directly to Stacey Ann, who is going to be speaking with us in a minute. Research is not only done in the sciences. Research is done and can be done in every field. And I think it's a tribute to our students and it's a tribute to our faculty who have enabled our students to push their envelopes of the research domain in places that many did not think they can go. And I, I'd encourage you when you look, if you haven't had a chance to look at the posters, you'll see posters of students who are not in fields that normally produce posters. History students don't often produce posters. Neither do social science as a norm. It's mostly the hard sciences and sometimes uh, the soft sciences. But we are pushing the envelope on the what, and we're pushing the envelope on the how in a way that I think is a tribute to who we are and what we want to do better. So let me just begin by thanking those people who have helped to make today possible. And I'm not going to go through the names. You see some names in the program. But I want to select and identify and give, as my son would say, a shout out yeah, provost can use that term to, you know, a shout out. I want to give a shout out to a couple of individuals who really worked behind the scenes at the last moment to help make this thing come together the way it has come together. And I'm not going to call faculty members. Faculty have been not only members of the advisory council. Kellyanne, Kelly Baker Josephs is not a member of the advisory council as yet but she was instrumental in helping us to get the keynote speaker. If I had to identify six people who have been at the pinnacle of helping to make this happen, those people would be the following. Dean Ronald Thomas. Is Ron Thomas in the house? Let's give him a round of applause in his absence. Yep. You, you don't want to know uh, what Dean Thomas had to do to help make the food available. Uh, to help make the honorarium for the keynote speaker available. But I also want to, and he is not necessarily going to be here, Andre Marsh, the chef and manager of this facility, works some magic that it's a don't ask, don't tell question, just so you know the food is good and it's tasty, it's not going to make you sick. But in the time of budget constraints, I want to especially say thanks to Dean Thomas and Andre Marsh who helped to make a lot of magic happen so that we can have a wonderful meal and we can have a wonderful experience with a keynote speaker. Now, it's often said that there is no such thing as a free lunch, and it includes today's lunch. And I want to tell you that in addition to the other people who I'll call shortly, this lunch is a thank you for our students. This lunch is a thank you for our faculty for doing the wonderful work that has begun and that will continue. Let's give our students and faculty a round of applause. <laughs> Part of the success of today has been dependent on the work of Shaniza Rohaman. Where is Shaniza? Give her a round of applause. Very last moment, pulling together a team of volunteers in helping to make this happen. Part of the success of today has been the instrumentality of Jean Cesarius. Where is Jean? Thank you very much for making this happen. And there are two students in Rishi's office who at least work 50 hours a week, uh, if that's possible, in making this happen the way it has happened. Tony and Orando. Stand up, Orando. I want to thank those six colleagues, especially in addition to the people whose names are mentioned. And not everyone's name is mentioned for the work culminating in this celebration of all what we do. We have a number of special guests from the FDA and other places. I want to thank them for coming. Uh, 
Members of our President's Advisory Board are also here. I want to thank you for your support. But my reference to the fact that there is no such thing as a free lunch applies to them as well. I'll be looking forward to their contribution to next year's luncheon uh, in one way or another. So uh, more on that score. I am hoping that next year we would be needing to use a bigger space. I'm hoping that next year we would have to have this luncheon session in the gym. And I'm giving myself and all of our faculty and staff colleagues a challenge. And the challenge is, let's see if we can increase by 50% the number of students we mentor, increase by 50% so we can have much more in the celebratory event at the annual student research day. Is that something you think we can do? Well, why don't we say yes, we have a round of applause. Come on. <laughs> Interestingly enough, this second research day at York coincides with a national undergraduate research week. There is an organization that is the leading national organization on undergraduate research called CUR, the Council on Undergraduate Research. And CUR has been around for for a while, one of the things we did last year as we launched our initiative is to become a part of CUR. CUR not only facilitates students and faculty doing undergraduate research, but it has some significant lobbying done in Washington and done in state capitals so that federal funding can go to faculty who want to help with undergraduate research. And so part of the lobbying effort by CUR last year led to a congressional resolution establishing an annual week of the year, known as National Undergraduate Research Week. And resolution 1654 established this week. Now it happened that we'd already had a tried our day to care ago. But I think it's a wonderful coincidence that we are celebrating our second annual research day the very week that Congress declared last November, going forward from 2011, to be the National Undergraduate Research Week. Give Congress a little applause. And I want to share with you just a couple of sentences from that resolution, House Resolution 1654, whereas close to 600 colleges and universities in the United States and thousands of undergraduate students and faculty pursue undergraduate research every year, providing research opportunities that will shape the trajectory of students' lives and careers, and researchers and institutions' purposes and contributions, blah, 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 yada, 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 you said. <laughs> Whereas the week of April 11, 2001, will be an appropriate week to designate undergraduate research week nationally, be it resolved. So while we are part of a history, and I'm going to see if at the end, of, by the end of this week, we can capture some of the sights and sounds from this day to post on the CUR site. Because CUR has been asking all member colleges, tell us what you're doing this week. If you're doing anything, we'd like to showcase. And so I'm hoping that among the pictures we're going to be taking, we'll get them processed early enough so that we can say to CUR, upload York. We want to show the world what York has done. Let me just end on the following observation, coming back to what Regina said in the beginning. And it's my long-standing view that, especially when we're talking to undergraduate students, there is a tendency to think of research only in the sciences. And it's part of that reason that I've, over the years, in crafting or sharing a definition of research, I've always tried to pick something out of the sciences. And if you have the program and you get a chance later on to look at the program, you'll notice, and if those of you who were here last year, you'll notice I also used it last year. I like to use something that someone from the humanities said. Zora Neale Hurston, a writer, an anthropologist. Because I think what she said in refining research cuts across all disciplines 
and highlights the students who may think that because you're a history student, or you're a women's studies student, or you're a political science student, you don't do research. Or that because you're a professor in the humanities or social sciences, research with undergraduate students is not your forte. And what Zoe Lynn Hurston said is something that I'd like to remind us. Research is formalized curiosity. Simply that. You're formalizing your curiosity. And she said it is poking and prying with a purpose. So whether you're a student or a faculty in chemistry or biology or occupational therapy, or you're a student or a faculty in political science or sociology or African American studies, each of you, each of us, can ex exercise some formalized curiosity. And so I like to think of a program as a program of programming formalized curiosity. We're about poking and prying the purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Rishi and Provost Griffith. Um, the next item on the agenda is the student faculty um, panel, which will be a short. Um, uh, survey, um, short introduction to the work that these students are doing with their mentors. We will have Charmaine Mercurius with her mentor, um, Professor Nicholas Grosskopf, um, Assistant Professor in the Department of Health and Physical Education. And on this side, from my department, English, we have Robert Springer and his mentor, Dr. Hebb. Heather Robinson. Um, do you need this to go there? Okay, so thank you guys, and if you could be like five minutes or so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right, we'll make it uh, really quick and brief. Um, I just want to quickly say thanks to uh, the program. You need to use the mic, please. Maybe, 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 right. you, maybe you might need to Not use that one. One. This one. This one. You want to get up and just go to the board? All right, all right. Okay, here. Okay. Okay, uh, I want to say thank you again to the provost um, for this initiative, to Professor Nath, and to the Office, for, uh, the Office of Undergraduate Research. Um, I'm very pleased to have been asked to, to do this. Um, and I want to, um, I know Charmaine's here, uh, you know, who's going to speak about her experience and, and the research we've done, but I really want to say thank you to all students who've been involved with uh, my research agenda, because there's been probably 20 or 30 over the past year and a half or so. Um, and one would think that um, if you're not familiar with what I do, I do sex research, and so you'd think that it would be pretty easy to get students involved in that, but uh, you know, when you're, when you're going out at, uh, on the weekends and in the evening um, with, with their busy schedule, some students you know, can't find the time, so I want to thank those students who, who have. Um, I just want to talk very quickly about the two studies that Charmaine has helped uh, me with and has worked on. Um, one has to do with, I uh, gave a provost lecture series a couple of years ago on online sex even when men have sex with men. And what I found in that initial study was that we were getting, and this happens a lot with uh, research, uh, with men who have sex with men, we're getting samples that were largely Caucasian, not very many men of color. And given the HIV uh, epidemic and new infections among young men of color, uh, young men who have sex with men of color, uh, you know, this, you know, a gap in the research. And so we tried to figure out ways to increase participation of, of young men of color. And we decided to, although this was an online survey, go out into the community and try to recruit men of color. And I thought that face-to-face -face contact would sort of ease some of the uh, apprehension they might have in talking to researchers. And so the other one that Charmaine helped with was um, a study looking at uh, how spirituality affects identity development among same-sex attracted men. And this was a street intercept survey. And so last summer we were out in the community, you know, at, a, at uh, fairs and picnics, stomping men in the street and asking them to participate. So, uh, you know, that was really exciting. Um, and we're just analyzing this data now. Uh, hopefully there'll be a couple publications coming out, which are going to definitely be a co-author. Um, and that's all I have to say. I won't take a few more time.
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to be here, and I'm also happy to be a part of this research. My experience with Dr. Grossoff on this research was rather interesting, and I've made a lot of discoveries for myself. Being an African-American female, also with an ethnic background of being from the Caribbean, where they were, and the society was homophobic. I've also gained experience with the research, and I'm able to implement it in my schoolwork and classwork, and I'm currently doing program planning where it is helpful in influencing my studies. Thank you so much. I was going to do something very humanities and read something, but I'm saved from that, so that's good. Um, the research that, the research project that Robert has uh, embarked upon this semester was born out of um, his being in a history of English language class, and we did quite a lot of work in that class on um, Creoles, English-based Creoles, and particularly those from the Caribbean, which you know is always a bestseller here because we've got so many students who have that linguistic experience as um, emigrating from the um, from the Caribbean, being a native speaker of English, um, but coming to the U.S. and having these sort of different uh, linguistic attitudes towards that English. It's often a marginalized, uh, uh, stigmatized kind of language. So I've been working on this independently in a project that I'm thinking at this point of as sort of educational ethnography. Um, sort of looking at, in particular, the linguistic experiences of uh, students at York um, who come from the Caribbean and are doing, how, how they're doing linguistically in classes here, because their experience is quite different from um, students who have sort of grown up in New York City. So anyway, uh, Robert's project was sort of born out of that constellation of interests. He has a, a very pragmatic attitude, I would say, <laughs> to, get to the sort of linguistic navigation, I guess, that, that he says, I can speak Caribbean English and I can speak New York English and so much better for me. <laughs> um, that's it's quite an unusual attitude, and so he's investigating sort of how widespread that kind of pragmatic approach is. So it's sort of, it is an ethnographic study. I will let now let him talk about what exactly he's done. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Well, um, based on what Professor Robinson is speaking about, um, my the main title of my work is the role of dialects within the immigrant West Indian community, and I use my family as a base for my study. <laughs> they were uh, interested to see my results in that, even though we both we all came from very similar backgrounds, even though I am Trinidadian and my but my mother is Trinidadian and my dad is Trinidadian as well. But we all have, when you ask the question of where you fall on the linguistic scale, as do you identify yourself as more British, more Trinidadian, or more American in the matter of your speaking, there is a really huge, like, I don't want to say difference in, in the way how we all identify ourselves. So it was interesting to me to say, well, even though we're so similar in our backgrounds, the way how we perceive, the way how we speak, is so profoundly different. And for me, I mean, the way how I want to present this study is that I don't want to say, well, I want to change everyone's view as how they see um, the way how people speak as to say, well, okay, I love it now. It's just to bring cold, cold attention to it because usually, as Professor Robinson was saying, there's a stigma involved where you automatically assume if someone speaks a slightly different way, you think, okay, that person's not that smart or something like that. And I use um, Chandra Nero's um, investigation in her studies, and that the stigma involved, it's usually, it comes down from the, from the professors as well, or the teachers as well, where when they see the students speaking a certain different language, they will assume that they can't write that well, or something like that. So the way how I looked at it, as ridiculous as this analogy may seem, is a snake eating its own tail, where the person you assume that the person is not that smart in order to do the work, so you're going to treat the person like they're not that smart in order to do the work, and the person is not going to learn how to do the work. Unfortunately, because we started slightly late, we don't have time for questions. <laughs> Sorry. Um, are there? Are, have you guys gone on panels already? 
you have panels coming up. Yes. So um, you may look through the program and um, go see these students um, present. Um, can, can, I, can I make a request, Kelly? Go ahead. Can I make a, re a, a request of you? How do I put this If you can just answer the following question by a round of applause or silence. <laughs> Would you like to hear these questions? These students and faculty have questions for them. Okay. Let's try two or three questions. Okay. Um, two or three questions. Who wants to be first? <laughs> Come on, you guys were clapping. <laughs> Did we all hear the question? Maybe we can. She asked what kind of feedback we were getting from men that we approached in the field to, to recruit for these studies. And I think I'm going to let Charmaine answer that question because she was the one doing the recruiting. <laughs> Thank you for your question. The feedback was very, very positive. And in the end of our study, it's actually 46% of African American men that were screened in total, and 56% white. Oh, sorry. Logistics. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Speak loudly. <laughs> I have a question for Mr. Springer. In your research, and you said you did a lot of questioning with your um, research with your family. While you were asking them, what kind of questions were you asking them? And wait, and how? I mean, you were just asking the West Indian people, but did you ask like any American born children or people living here in the U.S. how they see it? Because you know we flip it up, how we can speak dialect at home with our friends. And then when we come here, like now, I'm speaking differently. But when we talk, you and I, yes. we talk, we speak differently. So how was that interaction for the American-born children that grew up in these West Indians homes? Some of them, you know, transition well, and some don't even admit to their ethnic background at all. So how was that in your research? Well, for me, I'm the youngest of my family. So there was no, there were no American-born members of actually ask the questions, but I understand what you're saying, how there's certain American-born children of West Indian parents who completely identify with the, the West Indian side of their, their language. But the question, the first question that you asked about, what um, questions that I asked, I followed Professor Robinson's advice and didn't give them any terms. So I asked them what it is that you speak. So that allowed them to properly describe what they spoke. So it's not they're gonna relate it to a certain term that I gave them or anything like that. It's more of them, it's giving a more honest answer. I got a more honest answer in that they'll say, well, I spoke a Trinidadian form of English or a British influenced form of American English or something like that. It just allowed me to get a more honest answer from them. Thank you. Um, I'd love to hear the students tell us if you had to identify two things that you learned out of this experience that would serve you beyond being a student, what would those two things be? In other words, how has the research helped you to be a better student, but potentially either a graduate student or someone going to the workplace? It has helped me in both areas to further my studies, to become a graduate student, to be more involved in research, also on a personal level. I'm not judgmental and I don't have negative perceptions of individuals. Um, I would say the same for me as well in that um, it taught me to be a lot more objective in doing my research and Another thing it really taught me is that even though people may come from very similar backgrounds, they may have very contrasting um, ideals and way of viewing things. Thank you, um, both students and faculty members. Um, and now for the um, keynote speech um, from Stacey Anchin. 
Uh, Stacey Ann, I'll just do a short intro. Uh, Stacey Ann is the recipient of the 2007 Power of the Voice Award from the Human Rights Campaign, the 2008 Safe Haven Award from, the immigration, from immigration Equality, and the 2008 Honors from the Lesbian AIDS Project and the 2009 New York State Senate Award. In 2007, the Center for Women and Gender Studies at Dartmouth College selected her for the Visionary in Residence Award, and she remains a poet in residence at the Culture Project here in New York. A proud Jamaican national, Stacey Ann unapologetically identifies as Caribbean and black, Asian and lesbian, woman and resident of New York City. Her voice was featured on The Oprah Winfrey Show, where she spoke candidly about her experiences of growing up in Jamaica and the dire consequences of her coming out there. Widely known as a co-writer and an original performer in the Tony Award-winning Russell Simmons Deaf Poetry Jam on Broadway, her poetry has seen the rousing chairs of the New Yorkans Poet Cafe. Her one-woman one shows off-Broadway writing workshops in Sweden, South Africa, and Australia. Her three one-woman shows, Hands of Fire, Unspeakable Things, and Border Clash, all open to rave reviews in New York City. Whether it be on 60 Minutes or in the New York Times, Stacey Ann has a reputation for telling it exactly like it is. She has stated, quote, my world has never been about privacy. And to wit, she is now the author of the memoir, The Other Side of the Paradise, from which she will read today. Please join me in welcoming Stacey Ann to share her words. So whenever I'm invited to speak to Caribbean audiences, I'm simultaneously excited and dreading it. <laughs> Because Caribbean people, from my experience, and I came here when I was 24, so I, you know, I came fully baked. Um, or, or we say in Jamaica, we're out in a set on spring, meaning, um, meaning we have a tendency to be more direct <laughs> than other people, I suppose, and that's kind of true. Um, so I think in the beginning of the talks, I'm listening to the voices and making sure that I'm actually not just to you, but also um, there's a kind of exchange. And I'm thinking about the, 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 the notion of research and I'm listening to your voice. Um, Zora Neale Hurston is one of my favorite writers because she actually made it so that the speak of African-American uh, people had merit in the academy. So, meaning the way that they spoke became important and respected. Um, so there, there's a way that, you know, your, your um, talking about Zora Neale Hurston moved me, where she said, you know, curiosity, formalized curiosity is research. So there's a way that when you listen to people talk about education and the academy and university and college and GSAT and GREs and all that shit, you know, there, there, is, a, there is a way that you, if, if you are not, if those words aren't valuable to you, there's a way that you feel excluded from that process. Um, and, and the notion of turning curiosity or, 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 you know, into, 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 into what, what, what happens in these um, academies is interesting because everybody is curious about something. I mean, people who I know will never be in a university. If something is happening outside, there's a curtain being pulled. That's curiosity at work, you know. And if you said to this person, okay, I want you to write down everybody you see going into that person's apartment, and I want for you to, you know, figure out what kind of person visits this person, when they visit this person, what they say when they visit, what they're wearing when they visit, what she is wearing when particular people visit. 
and then write a paper about it. I suppose my grandmother could give you a real, <laughs> a whole paper. Do you know what I mean? But if you say to her, I want for you to observe these, you know, the, the, these candidates, and I want for you to, you know, dissect the, the data and um, come up with a kind of hypothesis and you know, um, we want to you know, make sure that your premise is right or wrong, blah, blah, blah. Then she's gonna be like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. You know, get out of my kitchen while I make some curry. Do you know what I mean? So, all, so, 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 so language is important and, um, and, 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 and it's important to find things uh, which in the academy can be um, can be drowned or entangled in a language that sounds um, off-putting. It's important to kind of break them down. So when you talk about research being formalized, curiosity and formalized, that means somebody in charge. You know what I mean? Somebody going to look at it and see whether it makes sense or not. And there's going to be a particular school and you know, somebody going to decide whether it makes sense. You know what I mean? That's what formalized means. Whether it's the provost or whether it's your grandmother. You know what I mean? Somebody in charge, right? And I'm, I want to begin with this one and um, this excerpt from my book. You know, I'm nine years old and you talk about formalized curiosity. This happened privately in my own nine-year-old world. And um, now it's in a book that is published by Simon and & Schuster and in big, big America, in big, big university. You know what I mean? So <laughs> that alone tell you the trajectory. Do you know what I mean? and I might get in trouble for it, but what the hell. <laughs> I feel like I've hit gold when I find three dirty picture magazines in the pile of abandoned books under the house. I dust them off to reveal a series of blondes wearing very small brassieres over their very large breasts. I read about women who are excited to discover something called the orgasm. None of the women have any clothes on, and all of them have their legs wide open. I look at the pictures of them rubbing their cocoa breads with shiny red fingernails. It's all very strange and exciting. My heart is beating fast, and then slow, and then fast again. In some of the pictures, the women look happy and sad at the same time, as if they were eating an ice cream cone that isn't really their favorite flavor. <laughs> Looking at the photographs makes me want to touch myself too. Plus, I want to know if my cocoa bread looks the same as the cocoa bread in the magazine. I decide the only way to find out is to have a good look at it. I choose the one place nobody would find me. The pit toilet. You're right. Day after day, it stands empty. You know what a pit toilet is, by the way? I mean, I mean you know. You know? Everybody know? It's an outhouse. No, I mean, you know, sometimes I'm in Connecticut, I have to explain. <laughs> day after day, the pit toilet stands empty until there's a water lock off. Not much more than a woodshed built over a 20 foot concrete covered sewage receptacle. The pit toilet is so small that only a makeshift toilet seat of wood can fit inside. And it smells like milk farts all the time. I look down into the hole. There are giant roaches crawling up the inner walls of the seat. Further down, bits of things are floating in what looks to me like a big black swimming pool. I climb up onto the seat and slowly squat. My naked bottom hangs over the gigantic opening of the square toilet. I carefully examine my cocoa bread. There are some things that look like mouths keeping a big secret. When I push the mouths open, a tongue pokes out at me. When I poke the tongue, the lips get wet. So I poke the tongue again, and again, and again, the lips get wetter and wetter. I am bouncing up and down so much, my foot slips and I fall into the pit. <laughs> my right leg and right arm are both completely in. The left arm is grasping at the side of the seat. The left leg caught in a strange angle that has just barely kept me from falling all the way in. I can't call anyone to help me. The dirty magazine is sprawled open on the floor. The stench from the waist below makes it difficult to breathe. And there are things I cannot see crawling along my foot. 
My palms sweat and make it almost impossible to get a firm grip on the wood. It takes me nearly an hour to drag myself up and out of the mouth of the pit. And when I finally collapse, shaking and picking pieces of roach legs off my hip and thigh, I know I'm never going to look at my cocoa bread ever again. <laughs> So I think that's a message to the lecturers here, the professors here. How you handle a young person's curiosity, the consequences of that curiosity is important. <laughs> because it took me years. So I always like to say, man, I wish I was privy to the conversations that happen after I leave. Yeah. Look around the room, you can see people's like, you know, the variations of like responses, you know. Why is she talking about our cocoa bread in public? <laughs> you know, in the Caribbean, we don't talk, we talk about penis all the time. The size of it, what it does, how much it spits up. <laughs> But we can't talk about the vagina. The vagina is like a big secret. <laughs> but what the hell, you know? I don't work here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, and that, my darlings, is entirely the role of the artist in times <laughs> of difficulty. You say the unsayable, you, un you upend the upendable. Yeah. You know, you, 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 just, you just poke at things, push the envelope, and you hope for conversations that bring people closer to who they are, what is important to them, and you help them to know each other a little better than they did prior to your visit. Um, so after that, what else can I tell you about myself? Like, that's like a big, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like anything else after that is like, really? Uh, I should tell you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read you one more excerpt about um, when I met my father. I'm part Chinese, part black. 100% Jamaican. Yeah. I know, you know, Jamaicans, we just love to just like, you know. I mean, where, where am I? I'm like, I'm in Soweto. I get on stage, you know, 3,000 people in the room, and I say, Jamaican, and everybody's like, boom, 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 boom. Like, no matter. I'm in like, you know, Melbourne, Australia. You know, I say, I'm Jamaica. Yes! And then being Chinese, we're everywhere too, you know, so like, you know, so you're Chinese, they don't really say but 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 they're like, yes. <laughs> we are everywhere. <laughs> so, um, my father, um, wealthy Chinese businessman in Montego Bay, my mother, poor, poor, poor girl, pretty, and uh, big ambitions, you know. And I'm not quite sure what happened between them. Um, but this is how I came. You know, I was, I'm 10 years old, and I live in abject poverty. You know, the kind of poverty that, you know, you, know, you don't have any pads, you don't have enough clean clothes, you don't have enough to eat, 11 people in three rooms, that kind of poverty. I mean, the pit toilet that I nearly fall into because I'm looking at my cocoa bread. You can see, it's not rich people life, right? So, um... Yeah, so I, I, this is what happened. Who used to read Mills and Boone? Who used to read a little romance novels? And you just skip to the part where you're like, oh yeah, 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 they like each other, they're talking, but where are they having sex? <laughs> <laughs> because her wealthy father abandoned her mother when she was a baby, the stunning and red-haired Summer Delaney is simply unable to trust the love of her life, Blade. When she goes to confront her father, he unfolds a yellowed note he has kept for this very purpose and reveals that it was Summer's mother who ran away from him. Everything becomes clear to her as she weeps into her father's arms. He begs her to forgive him for being absent from all the important years of her life. Finally, she forgives him and is able to give herself over completely 
to blade. This is the paragraph I'm reading. I close the Mills and Boone romance novel and decide it's time to call my own father. I'm going to call my own father tomorrow. When the last bell rings, I quickly make my way to the telephone booth on Church Street. It's Friday evening, so the phones are busy with people checking to see if relatives abroad will wire them money for the weekend. I wait while a woman on the phone asks her daughter if she will ever come back to Jamaica. I don't hear the answer, but the woman nods as the tears roll down her cheeks. She reminds her daughter to send money for the children's school fee. And don't forget to say you was going to send me a new Easter hat. All right, all right, me know the call expensive. Take care and come up good from that coal. When she says goodbye, her nose is runny and she's wiping her eyes. I slip into the narrow booth and search for the number in the big yellow phone book. I trace my finger down the long list of chins. There are four junior chins listed right after Joan Chin. I draw courage from the memory of Summer, demanding answers from her estranged father, and I dial the number with the address on Leader Avenue. I jump when someone answers on the first ring. The voice on the other end of the phone is deep, melodic. My voice cracks. Hello, hello. His response is impatient. Is anyone there? Hello, I say. Is this Mr. Hello? Who is this? Hello, to whom do you wish to speak? Hello? What number you want? I take a breath and grip the receiver. <clears throat> is this Mr. Is, is, is this Junior Chin? I want to speak with Mr. Junior Chin. Yes, this is Junior Chin. Who is this? This is, this is Stacy and Chin, and I want to know if you're really my father. The silence on his end of the phone is made louder by the sound of cars honking as they pass me on the street. I look at a bright red Honda going by and wonder if he has a car, if he will let me ride in it. Oh, Stacy Ann. My name sounds so sad on his lips, not excited like I'd imagined. Maybe he's worried about how much money it would cost to be my father. I know that he has other children, and children are very expensive. I want to tell him that he doesn't have to give me any money. I just want him to go places with me and to talk to me about the books I like to read. I want him to know that being my father isn't going to be expensive. I remember Summer's speech to her father. <clears throat> I begin. I really don't want your money. I can take care of myself, you know. I'm going to be somebody someday, a lawyer or a doctor. Doctors and lawyers make a lot of money. I won't need your money. I just want, I just want my identity. I, 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 just, I, mean, I just want to know if, if I got my nose from you and my crooked little fingers. People say that I get those things from you. My mother's nose is very different from mine and she doesn't, she doesn't have crooked little fingers. And, and I'm, I'm a really nice person, you know, and I, I read a lot, a lot of books, and I get really good grades, and, and, and he sighs. Okay, Miss Stacy Ann, can you come by my office on Tuesday? You know where it is? It's on Barnett Street, right in front of the police station. You can come right after school. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'll be there right after school. I run all the way to the furniture store on Tuesday evening. At the front desk, a woman waves me down the back. Which are the Mr. Chins you say you want? I'm looking for the owner of the place, I say, Mr. Junior Chin. He said I should come today. She doesn't say anything else. She just points me in the direction of his office. I navigate my way around giant rolls of red cloth and tap lightly on the door. Come in. I hesitate. Come in, man. Just push the door and come in. The office is a small room with piles of furniture paraphernalia all over the chairs. I have to clear myself a path to sit. Sit down there, young lady. I sit down in front of his desk. He looks at me for a long time before he speaks. He's kind of handsome. His hair is a little wavy and peppered with gray. I never imagined my father with any gray hair. The pictures of my mother are youthful and vibrant. He don't look like somebody my mother could be with. He's kind of old, <laughs> handsome but old. <laughs> How can I help you, little miss, he asks. Well, I call you because, because, I mean, you're my father, we should get to know each other. What are you reading, he asks. I beg your pardon, I say. 
You said on the phone that you read a lot. What are you reading now? I don't want to tell him that I'm reading a romance between Summer and Blade, so I tell a <laughs> lie. I'm reading a book called The Silver Sword, I say. It's about some children who lost their parents in a war and they're going somewhere to try and find them. The children are Polish. They are from Poland. <laughs> Young lady, we have to talk about some things, you know. He's silent for a beat. Then he continues. Do you know how a woman gets pregnant? Of course, I reply. First, she has to have sex with the man, and then he gives her sperm, and then the baby grows in her for nine months, but only sometimes. I was born at seven months. That's how I am with everything. I do everything fast. People say, that's why I'm bright, because I do things before I'm supposed to. Well then, if you're so bright, then you would know. If your mother and I had had sex, then you could be my child. But I, I never really had sex with your mother. There's no way you could be my child. But, but, but I'm half Chinese. I know, but you didn't get it from me. <laughs> but people say I look exactly like your other daughter. I know, I know. It's obvious you're of Asian descent, but there are 100 Chinese gentlemen in Montego Bay. Must have been one of them because it wasn't me. I'm very sorry, little girl, but that is the truth. Believe me, if I had had sex with your mother, I would tell you. <laughs> His eyes look like he's telling the truth. I don't want him to be a liar. It doesn't matter that people say I look exactly like his daughter or that I have ankles that turn in like his. He says I don't belong to him and that is that. I want to scream at him and call him a bastard, a piece of shit, a coward. I look at his face and see that this is very difficult for him. He looks right at me. Suddenly I want to protect him. So I say the most comforting thing I can think of. Well, <laughs> I guess that's all you can say. There's really, I mean, my mother says that you're my father, but she's not here to say anything. And, you know, don't worry, don't worry about it. Don't, don't worry about it. I pick up my bag. You know something, Mr. Chin? I really appreciate your telling me all of this. Big people don't tell children things because they think we're too young to understand. But we understand so much more than people think. The thing is, I mean, I feel like a big person most of the time anyways. I leave the building with the staff staring and passing comments on how tall I am, how much I look like my mother. Another Chinese man who looks very much like my father stops me at the door. Stop there, man, stop a bit. He takes me by the shoulder. What's your name? My eyes fill up with tears. Stacy Ann, sir, my name is Stacy Ann Chin. Okay, Stacy Ann Chin, your father is not here every day and he is your father. I am here every day. My name is Uncle Desmond, and you can come see me anything you, anytime you want. And if you need a book, a pair of shoes, just come here and I will try and see what I can do. You hear me? I'm sobbing now. Uncle Desmond is very kind, but I don't want him. I want my own father. I don't want an uncle. I want my father to call me back and tell me he was just joking, that he made a mistake, and that he is so very sorry. Listen to me, Stacey Ann. Uncle Desmond shakes me gently by the shoulder. If I'm not here, ask my, ask my wife. She is your auntie. She will help you. I nod and head out towards the front of the store. The workmen staining a new dresser tell me I look exactly like my sister. You're the dead stamp, and you have the same body as your mother. She was slim and neat, just like you when she used to visit. I have never seen these men, yet they all know about my mother. I walk to the taxi stand, hugging my school bag to my chest, just so I won't fall to pieces. My aunt is going to be so upset because I'm late coming home. My uniforms need to be washed for school the next day, and I want to kill my father, who is not my father. I want to be dead. I know that's really sad, but you see, it turned out okay, I'm here. Uh, so, I don't know. <laughs> what time we have? Yeah, we, a few questions. You want to sit, sit here? I'm, I'm pretty good. Okay. I'm pretty good. Are there any questions? <laughs> yes, shoot. Um, what got you into writing? Um, I came out as a lesbian when I was maybe 20, in early 20s in Jamaica. And um, on campus, you know, I'd worked out really, really hard. You know, my mother left when I was a kid. My father left. My father never showed up. <laughs> you know, often happens. Shocker. Um, so, you know, I worked really hard to kind of get into the upper middle class in Jamaica, you know? 
I worked hard. I did all my schoolwork. I, you know, learned to speak. You know, I, I, you know, I learned how to move like a person of middle class or upper class. I learned to speak that way. I worked really hard. I got into university. And then I said, OK, now I can figure out what it is that I am. And it became apparent to me that I was attracted to women. And um, I don't know why I thought that I would be protected, because I was a, a member of the middle or upper class at that time. And um, I came out as a lesbian on campus and was sexually assaulted by about a dozen boys in a school bathroom. And uh, I was like, I'm out, you know what I mean, to Jamaica. And I came here to the US. You know, think, you know they tell me, like, you know, if you want to find lesbians, go to New York. You know, you throw a rock in a crowd, you hit seven. You know what I mean? So I figure, you know, here is the place. If I want to go chase women without somebody chasing me with a machete, then this is the place, right? So I come to New York, and then wham, discover racism. It's like, shit. I'm not moving to like a lesbian commune in Nigeria. What am I doing? So I decided to like pick up myself and said, OK, uh, you can't keep chasing, you know, utopia. So you have to become more involved in the world that you want to see. You have to become a part of the vision you say you want. And so I became, um, you know, since I'm sort of funny sometimes, and, you know, have a knack of sliding a truth past some people who wouldn't necessarily hear it, I thought to myself, this is a nice thing to do. And I was young, and, you know, I was better looking than I am now. <laughs> so, um, you know, then, you know, Broadway and HBO and Oprah and the works and a book deal and <laughs> I know it, it just yeah, uh, yeah just the kind of you know but but it really I I I, sp I began to speak out because I in the moment when I landed and I discovered racism and I discovered snow and I was like what the hell what is wrong with these white people who said this is a freezer make us build a house <laughs> do you know what I mean like this is ridiculous what is wrong with them you know so um. I needed to voice some of those contradictions because my new country, which now opened the door for me to be safe and lesbian in, in spaces here, um, also there were issues about race. race and um, as I moved through the terrain of Brooklyn as a woman, it was not as easy as I imagined. And I was not a member of the class that was so protected in these spaces. And so the, the, the intersectionality kind of like fell down on me. And intersectionality just means that you have more than one thing that concern you. Like, <laughs> you're black, and you're lesbian, and you're poor, and you're, you know, you know like the more shit you have wrong with you, the more intersectionality is you. <laughs> um, basically. So, you know, when all those things kind of converged in my identity and my, my way of seeing the world, I know I needed to find something to do. I needed to speak out, and that was my way. We have another question. Do you have any advice for young girls who are, who want to be writers, who want to be a poet, who are lesbian, bisexual, transgender, whatever? Um, do you have any advice for any? You have to write what you know. You know what I mean? And if you, if you want to write about something and you don't know about it, seek to experience it. Do you know what I mean? You can't write about things you don't know, which means that you have to crack the, the walls of your world. You know, you can, it, six blocks alone can't work. You know what I mean? You have to travel outside. You have to say, OK, I'm not going to buy the sneakers, this whatever. I'm going to wear last winter's jacket. I'm going to put the sneaker money and the jacket money together with the, 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 the food I would have gone out to eat and the five drinks I would have had when I go out dancing. And that's like a ticket to somewhere. You know what I mean? And we're immigrants, which means that we are connected to people all over the world. In this room, the diversity is astounding. I almost never get to speak to a room like this. Never, because it's dark you know. so, Which means that if you say, I want to go to India, you could be like, wait. But somebody in this room knows somebody from India I could stay with. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, so you can go anywhere. You can go online and say, OK, they have tickets free to the Bahamas this week or next week, or you know, whatever. You can just say, I can afford a ticket to this place. Let me seek among my friends, find out where I can go. You have to kind of like cross some borders. And, you know, and the borders might not be India, but they might be, take a trip to Manhattan, go see a show for $5, $10.
go to the New Rican Poets Cafe. You have to crack the walls of your world open to have your experiences be wider. Um, and you also have to read. If you want to be a writer, you, how you going? You know, you see doctors don't know nothing about stethoscope and trying to take your temperature with something else. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like crazy how 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 people who want to be artists do not understand that it's a craft they have to learn. You have to spend some time with it, you know what I mean? You have to read other people's work that you admire, and you have to have friends who are like built-in shit detectors, so that when you write something and you're like, yo, this shit is like so sexy, and your friend is like, your metaphors are lame, your shit is cliche, it's not honest, and you're telling lies, so no. You know what I mean? You have to surround yourself with people who are able to tell you when what it is that you create is not up to standard or, you know, just a variety of people. Um, and you have to be brave. It, it, everything requires courage, but more than anything else, I think to be a writer, to expose the underbelly of human frailties requires courage, you know? And you can always like come and talk and then run home or something, I don't know. <laughs> yes? You, but your, your aim should not be to publish a book. Okay. Your aim should be first to write a good book. You know what I mean? And then you figure out the publishing. When you say, okay, I have an amazing book here, you take it to your professor, you send it to publishers. I mean, one of the wonderful things about how my career happened is that it never happened intentionally. You know, I wanted to write good work. I wanted to write things that were... Um, were breaking the envelope in which I lived. Um, so I, you know, I, I followed behind writers, you know what I mean? Like Derek Walcott, who is wonderful in many ways. <laughs> you, know, you know, I studied with him for a while. I moved, you know, and I, I studied with people who weren't necessarily academic writers. I spent a bunch of years in the New Rican Poets Cafe. I traveled to other places. I, I don't know, you just have to be willing to always be a student. Uh, yes, I'm a memoir writer. I can't make up nothing. I mean, life is too crazy. Come on, you know? <laughs> you know? You know what I mean? Like, you know, my mother is like living in Germany. You know, she's got like, she's mentally ill. My father is, and I have this weird relationship. I go to Jamaica. I visit him. I bring my girlfriend. We have a drink, but he's not saying he's my father and I'm not asking. And none of us want to do a DNA test, even we both can't afford it. You, do you know what I mean? It's weird. And then, like, my brother is in Germany, not really talking to me because after the split when we were children, we never quite made it. My sister, who's 16 years younger than I, is like, First language, German. I can hardly, I mean, I speak German, but not well. She hardly speaks English. We talk all the time. It's like a crazy kind of like, oh, and the only thing we have in common is this crazy, mentally ill mother, you know? You know, you know, I don't know, like, you know, and then I have this kind of weird career. Like life, you know, you just stand outside on the corner and you just say to like a little old Caribbean man, how is it going? Here? Oh, if I was 30 years young. I mean, this is a story happening. <laughs> as soon, they're on every corner. You know, so I don't really need to make up anything. I'm not good at it anyways, but you know. Yes, in the back. I never know if it's gonna be good. You write it, and you keep working at it. You know, the god of writing is editing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like you have to worship at the feet of editing, because maybe 80% of what you write is crap. And then you need somebody who's a good editor to help you figure out what the crap is and to keep the kind of jewels. Um, but I like books that, I love memoirs. You know, this is the age of the memoir. This is the age of true life stories, you know, from um, Nelson Mandela's uh, Long Walk to Freedom to, you know, uh, you know Lorna Goodison's, you know, R Harvey River to, you know, I don't know, there's like a ton of work in the world. You know, Edwidge Dantica, who is Haitian, like she gives this like amazing breath and, you know, uh, she made me like not see what CNN does with like Haitians. Every time you see somebody, they're wailing and they're coming up under the rubble. Like that's all there is with being Haitian. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know. There's like amazing stories out there that people have survived and live coming onto the continent of Africa. I mean, 
sexy, sexy books, you know? When I was younger, I used to read more fiction, but now I'm like really into memoirs. Good ones, and they're hard to find. You just read it, and if you like it, yes. And if you don't like it, read something else. Just keep reading. I mean, like you sit on the toilet for 20 minutes every morning. You know what I mean? Like read, you know what I mean? On the train, you know what I mean? You know, some of you are having sex. Those of you who are having sex just after sex is a good, you read a chapter. Do you know what I mean? Just read, read. There's so many opportunities for you to read. And you just get brighter and you get sexier because when you're talking, you know, like when you're checking out somebody and you're like, yeah, I like you, you know, like, you're just like, yeah, so, um, yeah, so have you read? And, you know, <laughs> because I read a book the other day and I want to tell you about it, you know, without the neck rolling. But generally, you know what I mean? It, you're sexier when you read, you know what I mean? Dunce is not sexy. <laughs> and dunce has nothing to do with, like, the language in your mouth. It has to do with, like, your openness of experience, your ability to kind of stand in it. Yeah. There was a question over no. here. Okay, no. Bed gone. Wait, wait, Final question. Or not. <laughs> yes. How long, on average, does it take you to write? How long on average it takes me to write? I don't know what you mean by that because I write every day. And there are things that I've been writing since I was 20 that's not quite finished. And then there are things that take me shorter times to write. You never know. You write. I mean, it's like asking a lawyer how long it takes you to law. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, you do it every day, you know what I mean? If these teachers show up every day, they don't be like, oh, damn, I only have, like, two hours. It's like, you have to, anything, anything you're doing, you have to just kind of do it, you know? And sometimes it takes you longer. It's like taking a, you know, a crap, you know? Sometimes it takes long, you just have to stay with it, you know what I mean? <laughs> and other times you're down, it's out, you, you know, you're like, work of art. <laughs> You just have to stay with it because it's a process and it's something you do every day or ever so often. Thank you so much for your time. I'll be signing books in the back. So I'll see you by the table. Done. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you, Stacey Ann. It's just the thank you time. Um, on behalf of the Office of Undergraduate Research, we'd like to thank everyone for participating and to remind you that there are panels still happening. Um, right after this luncheon at 2 p.m., there will be three panels, one on jazz ethnogra ethnography, one on economic development, and one on the politics of gaming. Um, they're in your program, so you can see the room numbers. There's also the poster session and um, the CUNY Aviation Institute and the York College Theater will present a 10-minute scene from their upcoming collaboration entitled The Crash of American Eagle 4184 in the atrium. So thank you all for coming um, and go forth in secret research. Oh, there are books in the back. Um, Stacey Ann will be...